evacuation of the sick and wounded by air has been one of the outstanding developments of the medical service of the Army Air Forces. Distances from forward medical installations are sometimes difficult to overcome in evacuating casualties by land. Trucks loaded with troops and supplies congest the roads, and so far as railways are concerned, they are often inadequate. In certain theaters, there just aren't any. When such problems arise, air evacuation offers the solution. Since the war began, prompt and speedy evacuation has saved hundreds of lives, prevented permanent injuries, and brought casualties to base hospitals in a matter of hours instead of days. A case in point, the North African Theater. Here at Maison Blanche, the air base in Algiers, air evacuation has performed with gratifying success. Preparations for air evacuation are underway. Air evacuation teams are to leave Maison Blanche to the forward medical installations at El Gara, where casualties are to be evacuated from this front. Here is the air base at Maison Blanche. The skeleton hangars and damaged buildings are the result of recent heavy bombings. The field hospital was destroyed, so tents now serve as the medical supply depot. Litters and other medical equipment will be taken from here by means of ambulances and then to the planes. Air evacuation service nurses are preparing to go on duty. There are four, one for each plane of the squadron. Despite the handicaps of bombings and heavy rains, work at the airbase is proceeding on schedule. Here, the operations officer is checking the field in preparation for the takeoffs of the 802nd Medical Air Evacuation Transport Squadron. Litters are being transferred from the ambulance to the plane and will be received at El Gara together with other necessary medical equipment. They will take the place of the litters used in evacuating the wounded from the front. This is known as the automatic flow of medical supplies. Its purpose is to ensure the sufficiency and readiness of medical property at all times in the forward areas. A jeep takes the nurses to the planes. Note that they wear regulation flying clothing and boots. These nurses have received special training for air evacuation service. The haversacks they carry contain field medical equipment, items necessary for the treatment of patients during evacuation. There are ample supplies of narcotics for the relief of pain, bandages and compresses for reinforcement of battle dressings, and whatever medicines are required for emergency treatments. One nurse and a medical department staff sergeant form an air evacuation team. There are 24 such teams in a medical air evacuation transport squadron. Their job is to give necessary medical attention to the wounded during flight. When the situation demands, a flight surgeon accompanies the team. The C-47s prepare to taxi to the line. These ships are not marked with a red cross due to the fact that they are cargo planes from troop carrier squadrons. The same used to transport paratroops, airborne troops, and all types of materiel and supplies. Tomorrow they may be called upon for one or all of such purposes. When they are over combat areas, they are convoyed and protected by fighter aircraft. The squadron flies to El Gara, a distance of 200 miles. They're over the advanced base at El Gara now. 
Immediately after the planes land, litters and medical supplies will be unloaded. The walking wounded are taken from the forward medical installation to the ambulances. Each casualty wears an emergency medical tag. This tag is put on by the first member of the medical department who attends the patient. Name, army serial number, and additional identification are noted, together with diagnosis of case and treatment given. The tag stays with the patient until he reaches the base hospital. Litter cases are being loaded into ambulances by medical personnel of El Gara. Work must be done in minimum time, for this is a combat area and speedy evacuation is an obvious necessity. Time of departure is checked and noted. Members of the Air Evacuation Service always try to cut down the time required to transfer casualties to the planes. Enemy air activity is an ever-present threat and groups must not congregate on the ground for long periods. Immediate evacuation reduces exposure of casualties. The men are trained to handle litters skillfully, to avoid jarring or bumping, which might pain or affect the injury of a patient. After each ambulance receives its allotment of casualties, it is driven to the airport. Drivers line up awaiting further instructions. Assigned the planes to which the wounded are to be transferred, the ambulances start for the ships. The wounded are taken into the planes. Again, this procedure demands the most careful handling. Note that the litter bearer facing the camera is being guided by the staff sergeant member of the evacuation team. Bumps along the side are thus avoided and the litter kept on a steady level. The litter is raised slowly to the middle rack, then to its place on the top rack. Shoulder lifting is taught to make for smoothness and ease of loading. The third man, who has acted as guide, clamps the litter down into the top tier. A second casualty is brought in, the litter guided into the lower rack. Standard procedure requires that top and lower racks be filled first, eliminating any possible interference through clamps and gadgets on the racks. Often patients have been operated upon in a forward medical installation, evacuated while still under anesthetic, then flown to the base hospital where efficient nursing care is available for post-operative treatment. When both walking and litter patients are being evacuated in the same plane, only the top tier is used for litters. Walking wounded are placed on the ship's bucket seats. These are the same seats used by paratroopers and airborne troops when being flown to combat areas. When filled, the C-47 will carry 18 litters. One of the nurses checks the patients, examines the dressings and splints, adjusts blankets, does everything she can to make the patient cheerful and comfortable. Note that she has removed her flying boots in order to make her way through the ship more easily. The flight surgeon also checks the patients. Certain cases on this ship are serious, so he goes along to aid his team in case of emergency during flight. The medical department staff sergeant follows, charting the casualties, the records of which will be turned over to the base hospital. The casualties loaded, the planes take off for Maison Blanche. Later, these particular casualties will be driven from Maison Blanche to the 96th British Base Hospital 
at Maison Carré. Fighter protection mentioned earlier is now seen in action. P-38s and P-40s are convoying the air evacuation squadron on its return flight. However remote the possibility of enemy attack may seem, these fighter planes are on the alert. Inside the ship, the flight surgeon and staff sergeant are attending the patients. The nurse gives water to the casualties, checks bandages, and sees that dressings are in place. Patients receive constant attention, and immediate treatment is given should effects of the flight make it necessary. The flight surgeon and the air evacuation teams are trained to take care of any emergency that may arise. The sergeant keeps his chart up to the minute, marks it with information on the cases as given him by the flight surgeon. An accurate history will facilitate base hospital treatment. The planes are back in Maison Blanc. They taxi to the dispersal area, where the casualties will be unloaded. Some of the men aboard are suffering from sickness, including tropical diseases. Medical officers with the Army Air Forces must be able to go to any port in the world on 10 hours notice to battle any outbreak of disease peculiar to the geography of the country. Records of their findings, together with sanitary reports, are sent back to the United States to aid in discovering ways and means of conquering epidemics. The unloading of casualties begins. Note that they are being removed to British ambulances, after which they will be driven to the British base hospital at Maison Carré. British and American forces have been collaborating splendidly, working on a share and share alike basis, and here is an excellent example of such cooperation. In similar instances, British wounded have been air evacuated to American base hospitals. Allied efforts of British and American medical departments have helped step up the progress of evacuation of the wounded by air. Walking wounded leave the plane for trucks, which will take them to the base hospital. The wholehearted collaboration between American and British medical corps is fully evidenced. The wounded you see being taken from the plane are German prisoners. This is the first time that enemy prisoners have been air evacuated in any theater of operations. Thus, German prisoners are being unloaded from American planes into British ambulances. Note the American armed guard standing by as the Germans are delivered into the ambulances. Another time check is made by the flight surgeon, and the first ambulance drives off. Other ambulances follow and head for Maison Carré under motorcycle escort. The final point of the journey, the 96th British Base Hospital, where treatment of sick and wounded will be expedited because of prompt evacuation from the locale in which they receive preliminary care. Collaborators in the accomplishment of this mission and in the development of subsequent operations are Brigadier Cowell of the British Medical Corps and Colonel E. E. Elvins of the American Medical Department. The last step, unloading patients from ambulances into reception tents. British medical personnel is in charge, and the American casualties are checked as they are taken from the ambulances. The emergency medical tag and the chart records tell the history of each case, so that no time is lost in continuing treatments at the hospital. The complete evacuation has been accomplished in only three hours. Land travel in this particular sector would have taken five days to a week. 
Although air evacuation is still in its early stages of development, results have been impressive. At the time these pictures were taken, more than 9,000 American, British, and French, sick and wounded, have been evacuated by air in North Africa. More than 400 had been moved in one day. And since that time, this figure has been exceeded. In the South Pacific, where in certain sectors, 100% air evacuation is used, 692 casualties were brought back in a single day. Overseas air evacuation of the sick and wounded continues to grow, and casualties are returned from all theaters. The longest hop has been from Chongqing to the United States and has been accomplished in four days. The chances for survival and rehabilitation of casualties have been immeasurably improved by this means of transport. What you have just seen is only one instance of air evacuation. The same service is being rendered in other theaters. New Guinea and Guadalcanal, for example. We are making progress in evacuating casualties by air from overseas to the large hospitals in the United States. This means the saving of shipping tonnage, naval escort, and the personnel involved in hospital ship transport. As the practical use of air evacuation becomes more and more evident, we are constantly striving to enlarge this service, thus assuring all Army personnel the best of medical attention regardless of where they may be.